Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes? Okay, great. Um, well, welcome to our program. I am Alexandra Schindler. I am the Collections Registrar and Los Gatos History Project Program Coordinator here at NUMU. Um, and to begin, I would like to um, welcome to our program, Catalog It, How to Manage and Enjoy Your Collections, featuring uh, Dan Rael, the co-founder of Catalog It, our collections management software, and Daniel Keough, a librarian from the Los Gatos Library. Um, and to begin with, uh, we would like to acknowledge that the New Museum Los Gatos sits on the ancestral land of the Ohlone, the Tamian Ohlone, and the Muwekma Ohlone people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We recognize their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, and learn on their traditional homeland. We pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people, past, present, and future. This is one step towards creating a safe place for the community to learn from the past, dialogue about the present, and move forward. Uh, if you would like to visit NUMU, can everyone see my screen? This? Yes, we're good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, if you would like to visit NUMU, we are open um, Thursday 3 to 8 and Friday through Sunday 10 to 4, where you can see many of the objects in our collection on display in our Los Gatos History Project, Uncovering Untold Stories exhibition. And the Los Gatos, oh no, oh yes. The Los Gatos History Project um, has a goal to tell the untold stories of Los Gatos through the exploration of our permanent art and history collections. Um, and that includes a full inventory of our collection. And in order to do that, um, we selected Catalog It as our new database in order to share our collections online. Um, and so with that, I would like to pass it off to Dan to talk more about Catalog It. Thank you very much, Alexander. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm one of the founders of Catalog. You might have read the little bio about me that was <laughs> included on the new, new you, uh, website. I really appreciate them putting that out there. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, about collecting to begin with. So why, you know, uh, <clears throat> first of all, the Catalog, the, the system that, that the uh, new museum of Los Gatos is using is a, is a uh, plan that's made specifically for museum accounts, but we have a, a, a accounts that are also for private collectors. In fact, kind of like we originally designed as a program for the private collector, for the average person with some kind of collection they want to document. That's who we initially built this program for. So, um, so why would you want to go ahead and catalog your things? What's the what's the reason? Why why would you do that? So there's a few really kind of basic reasons. Probably the, the most one that people are going to think about is uh, is for insurance purposes. You know, you want to document those things in case something happens to them. Um, gosh, uh, we talked with a client up in, in Santa Rosa that unfortunately had things very well documented on their computer and a backup on a hard drive that was unfortunately next to their computer in their house, which they lost. And so not only did they lose most of their collections, but they lost all their documentation about it as well. So kind of like- It's why. Yeah. He is Santa Rosa. What's your selling? A service that helps you document your collection. <laughs> Everybody mute. Somebody's got their- <laughs> Uh, their microphone up in there so you might want to make sure that you're muted uh, yeah so and so uh, another reason that's worthwhile documenting your things is that it actually increases their value and not only does it increase their having something well documented um, increases its monetary value but it can also increase the increase the intrinsic value of those items and we'll get into that here as i get into a little bit more of the display and pardon the light right now this this time of day the light's coming right exactly at the wrong at the wrong angle for me to be presenting here but i think you can see me okay um so it also helps you sort of preserve the physical integrity of the item if you have the item well documented and some good images of the item you can actually look at those images and instead of actually handling the item you, know, you, you you take less of a risk of breaking it or somehow damaging it or putting fingerprints on things that are very delicate. So a few good images will help you preserve that thing. You can put it, put the original away and, and just use the, uh, the electronic records going forward. 
Um, another reason is that it can help you understand what you've got. You know, sometimes you may not realize. Um, did I lose my share screen? I think. <laughs> Alex, can you see my screen okay? We don't see your screen. We haven't seen your screen yet. yet. Okay, that's right. I'm not sure. I just want to make sure I'm there. I just got a, a, a large view of, um, of Alexander. Uh, so, okay, so yeah, so you, you can get a better understanding of the types of things you have in your collection, whether or not you, you might have holes in some portion of your collection, you're missing a particular area uh, uh, of, of collecting that you, you didn't realize. Uh, I also have documented a lot of my books, and it helps me understand, for instance, when I go to the, you know, a, a new uh, used bookstore, I find a great book, and I've done this several times before I have my things documented, I buy that book and bring it home and put it on the shelf and realize I already have that book. <laughs> so documenting helps you understand what you've got. So I'm gonna hop in the chair screen right now and talk to you, to you a little bit about cataloging your things and how you can use a system like Catalog It to do that. So give me one second here. Okay, so hopefully you're looking at my screen. And this is what Catalog It looks like when you first log in. You're com you come into a screen that's called All Entries and it's just literally everything you've got is right there. And what's particularly handy about a screen like this is that you can uh, you can search across it. This search, this little search icon right here, allows you to look across every piece of text that's any place in any of your entries. So, you know, looking at all my items here, I've got a couple of postcards here that uh, that have a baby. In. So let's just see what else what else do I have that's got a baby? Um, I'm not even sure here. So I search for baby, and gosh, well, it looks like I actually have a lot of things that relate to a baby. Um, dolls with babies, baby moccasins, <laughs> some baby cradle boards. Uh, little statues of babies. Actually, I have a lot of things that have a baby. So that search is really a, a neat function. You find relationships, you find things that, uh, that you may not have even realized that, that, that were there. So uh, this all entries, you can see I've got here, there's a little blue box at the bottom that shows that I've documented 661 things so far of my, you know, my eclectic collection here. Um, you know, in the museum world, sometimes that can be, of course, much, much larger that we have clients with you know, tens of thousands. In fact, I just did a migration that had uh, nearly 190,000 items. In it. So this, you know, there's no, almost really no limit to what you can put in there, how many things you can add to your, to a collection. And of course they'll all load up here and you can actually scroll through them. And you're not likely to want to scroll through 190,000 items, but to search across them is really handy. But you can also subdivide your collection into all kinds of groups of things that can be useful to you. So I'm going to click here on this, what we call the main menu, these three uh, bars on this side here. And you can see there's my all entries folder, but I've also created a whole bunch of other folders, just other types of things that I wanted to group together. To me, it's handy to have these um, uh, separate sorts of groupings. But in Catalog, uh, with a subscription, you can also share your collections out to the web, whether you're a museum or whether you're just a private collector, you can share, uh, share your collections. And you can see some of my folders here have a little globe symbol in them. So those are ones I'm currently sharing out to the, for the public to see. And I'll talk about why I do that and, and, and uh, what that looks like here uh, just a little further on. Um, I'm actually going to scroll to the bottom and say I've created a lot of folders here. Uh, one entry, by the way, can live in as many folders as you want. So you might have a postcard that's, you know, such as this Christmas card here that's with all your Christmas collections, but it's also with your postcard collection. So it can be in as many places as you want to. Um, I'm actually going to create a new folder here real quickly. I'm going to start to collect things that relate to my mom. So I'm just going to call this folder mom for now. I could later on add a description if I want to, etc. here, but I'm just going to create this and, and we'll, uh, we'll use it here in just a minute. So I'm going to go back to my all entries here. Um, and let's take a look at, at a folder that's got some things in it here. So let me scroll down. Let's grab this dolls folder, for example. So this, as you can see, this is where I put all these uh, all these various dolls. Um, now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things you can do from this side of the menu here, these three dots. So this is what we call the actions menu. And there are things, you know, you're documenting your stuff, not just to only have the, the, the record of it, but you want to do things with those records, right? So from these, this actions menu, there's a couple things I want to point out here. So one of the things that's really handy is the ability to, to, like I mentioned, for insurance purposes, you can quickly run with one click an insurance report. So I click on insurance, for, for an example here, and it just quickly generates a report of, of the things that you need for your insurance. You know, you prop, I could print this to a, a PDF and email it to my insurance guy and tell him I want to write around my policy for, for these items. It shows what they are, you know, a quick description of what they are, how much you paid for it. And this valuation is going to be based on whatever the most recent value you've got either uh, the most recent appraisal or estimation or the purchase price. So quick and easy way to generate, a, 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 for instance, an insurance report. But uh, I also want to point out from these three dots, again, that actions menu, um, the print function. So print and catalog it is, is like a, a, an ad hoc report writer. So it's a way that you can 
create all kinds of neat reports from your from your items here. So let me show what that looks like. There's a few different types here, and I'm going to point out a couple of them. So pages is, is a is an easy way to create like a nice PDF report of your collections. It defaults to showing uh, some common information about the object. If I click all, it shows all the other fields that are available in this place, any place in this folder uh, that I, of fields, and I can just select them and add them into my um, uh, into my re report here. I can select ethnography, for instance. I want all these Native American materials attached there as well. Um, I can include the, the primary image. If I select here, I can actually include all the images. So you know, a lot of these I have multiple images of. I can include them all. Now this can be really handy for you know just if you want a paper backup if you want to send it off to somebody to show them what you know something in particular that you've got that maybe they're interested in, uh, but you can also imagine you know you, you pictures like this uh, and descriptions can be really handy for if you needed them for police report for instance um, all kinds of reasons why you might want to might want to be able to generate a report like this so again it's super easy within you know less than a minute you've generated a really nice report. Uh, another one I want to point out is the um, from the print functions is the label printer, and this is also a really interesting and I think really fun one here. So it defaults to three columns. Let's go ahead and make it four columns. Uh, it defaults to showing the the thumbnail image, the name, and if you've given uh, uh, a number to your items, so like the museum is going to have the, an accession number. If you've got some kind of an inventory number, that would also be a default uh, thing that would show here. Uh, again, you can select all and choose any other fields you want to add. But another kind of neat thing to add is a QR code. You know, if you're like me, a lot of your collections are boxed up and put away and you take them out every once in a while. But to have a sticker like this stuck on the outside of that box with the little tiny image, the QR code, and this is an internal QR code. So that means only me and anybody else I've given uh, login access into my account can scan this and open this up, open up the record on their phone or their, uh, or their iPad, whatever it might be. Um, so it's a really handy way to, to create, you know, uh, very useful quick labels. I'm going to close that real quick. So let's go, let's go back to the all entries here and we'll talk about creating a new entry here. Well, actually, first let's look at an entry. Let's go ahead and look. Let's, let's look at, um, at this one right here, this uh, Mary Yuletide postcard. So, you know, at the beginning, I mentioned some of the reasons you want to catalog, and one of them is to add value. And I mentioned adding intrinsic, uh, intrinsic value to something. And this is a great example of that. So you can see this is. It's not a great postcard, you know. It's a postcard that the you know the antique store would be twenty five or fifty cents. It's old. It's actually in poor condition. It's not a very exciting image. Um, but when we start to look at some of the details of the postcard, that's where it starts to, to get particularly interesting. First of all, the type of postcard. It's it's an old postcard. Uh, it's postmarked December twenty second, nineteen seventeen, and that makes it a little bit more interesting. And you can think about you know the United States had. Uh, had entered World War I and we were really gearing up to go to war in France and Germany. This was mailed from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Uh, the addressee is a person named Frank Trimberger and it was sent to the company B as a 310th engineer. So it was sent to this guy while he was in, uh, in basic training in, for World War I. Now, this gets all the more interesting for me because Frank Trimberger is my grandfather. So this was actually a postcard sent to my grandfather in 1917, and here's the transcription of it. You know, we're all sorry to see you couldn't come home for Christmas. Um, I hope you can home, come home on the 26th. It's sent by his sister, my great aunt Lucy. Uh, so this postcard all of a sudden, instead of just being a 25 cent postcard at the antique store, has a lot of real meaning to me and to my family. This postcard is, a, is priceless now. You know, it's a, it's a neat piece of family history. Um, when you're looking at an entry like this in catalog, you see that there's a lot of little tags on things in here. And what the way those work is they actually relate your collection to anything else you've got that's using whatever that particular piece of data is. So for example, I can click on Sheboygan here and I've got actually created a little bit of a description of Sheboygan. Um, I even have a Wikipedia link here to Sheboygan if I wanted to look at it. I can click on this link here and see that I've got 23 other things in my collection that have some kind of a connection back to Sheboygan. So once again, I'm seeing those relationships and some of these things I may not have even realized that some kind of connection to Sheboygan. But they're particularly useful for, for people. So here's my grandfather, Frank Trimberger Jr. So this opens up a little snapshot into his record here and I can see some of it, but instead I'm actually gonna click on this link and go to his full record. Gosh, here's my, my you know, here's a picture I found of my grandfather uh, during World War I. Actually, instead of, um, Instead of being sent off to the trenches in France, he was uh, part of a small group of soldiers that was rerouted and sent actually to Northern Russia instead. Uh, and at this point, the, 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 um, the Tsars had been overthrown, but this, the US and a bunch of other uh, allied troops were actually fighting on behalf of the, of the, 
the, the czar's government, which barely existed uh, in northern Russia against the communist, uh, uh, the communist revolutionaries. So here's my grandpa right here in the middle of this picture. Here's actually a picture I found of him uh, with his uh, army uniform. And again, here's all these relationships of him. I actually have a, a Wikipedia page for what they call the polar bears, this American expeditionary force that was sent to Russia, and all these other things that have some kind of connection to him. Um, and I can navigate directly to any of them right from here. So, for example, let's click on this. So this is a this is another postcard that was sent to my grandfather in 1912, so long before the war. So I'm creating this whole web of connections of, of between all these things here. Uh, it's really it, it's really a lot of fun. So I'm going to go out of this here and let's go ahead and, and create a new entry now. So to do that in catalog, you've got this orange plus button down here. We try to make this as kind of as easy and intuitive as possible to create new entries. Um, we wanted to make sure, we wanted to make it actually almost as easy to create a new entry in catalog as it is to create a, an Instagram post. I mean, it should be it should be that simple. So when I click on this, it gives me a couple of options here. Um, I can grab a photo that I've got saved someplace on my computer. I can grab a file if I've got a PDF or some other kind of a scan of it or an Excel file even, or a Word document if I want to use that to start documenting. But I can also create one without any image. You know, there's no problem not having an image in there. You just show that it actually would show the catalog at logo in, in, your, in your field here when you don't have an image. Um, but I should point out that pretty much everything I'm doing on this uh, demo here, uh, this, this talk, you can do from your phone or your tablet as well. So you just go to the App Store or the Google Play Store, download the catalog at app. You log in with your uh, same credentials that you use to log into your, uh, your account and your desktop. And you're up and running and to use them in conjunction is just really uh, super handy so if i was on my phone it would be the first option here would actually be to use my phone to take a picture and start creating the entry directly from that picture i'm actually going to click photo here and it's going to open up the finder in my uh, in my computer here so i don't think this shows on the screen share but i'm going to choose the image of the item i want to document today and it is this little uh, cracker jar here, this biscuit jar. So the first thing I do is give it a name. That's the only thing that's actually required to create an entry in catalog. So yes. you notice how when someone's watching is when you all of a sudden can't type anymore. <laughs> so blue glass biscuit jars. So I'm giving it a name. And here's some things that can be really handy, particularly if you've taken the photo on your phone. The, the ability to rotate a picture, your phone often insists that something is a landscape or portrait and you want it the other way. Uh, I can click these crop lines too, and I can have, you know, if I had extraneous space or it was off centered, I can crop out, you know, some of the, the extra. And in this case, I don't really need to do that. So, uh, and you can see I've got these kind of gray bars that define uh, this kind of highlighted section in the middle. That's, that allows you to click and drag this image so that it shows so, so that what you want to highlight is kind of showing up in that in that thumbnail image. So this light lit up square is what's going to appear in my thumbnail image. So now in catalog it, there's this little next button. So what do you do? You click next and, and what it's going to ask is, okay, what, what sort of a thing is this? What, what kind of a, a classification would you like to use to document this item? Um, it starts with recommended, which is what you've used most recently, but there's also other fields here that are kind of the most active in the in the in the folder that you're currently working in. And I'm making this from my all entries folder. So I got all kinds of things here that I've been using. And you'll find that some of these are there's some kind of overarching uh, classifications like object artifact, which will work really for documenting almost anything. But some of these other classes are actually subclassifications of object artifact, which means that. If I selected ceramic, for instance, it's going to bring in all the object artifact things plus some fields that are specific to ceramics or baskets or, or banknotes. But I'm just going to select object artifact here, and that'll bring in the fields that I think that will be fine for me to catalog this jar here. So there we go. It's uploaded my image. If I had more images, I could click and drag them here. If I'm on my phone, I can click the icon down here and open up my camera and take, take more pictures. If you're using the app directly, those images are stored directly in catalog. It's not, they're not building up on your, you know, in your, uh, in your photo roll on your phone. And so now it's ready to go ahead and start to, to document. So there's a couple of different types of fields here you can use to, to document the thing. Um, these fields like test, like description and use are text fields, and they're not limited by, you know, by the length of this bar. You can type in pages of text if you want to. Uh, and remember that all, whatever words you use to describe the thing, uh, are all searchable and findable with your with your search from that all entries or from it within a particular folder. Now, as you get further along here, I'm not going to go through all these fields. I think uh, again we pride ourselves on things being really uh, intuitive. But let's take a look at just a couple of them. Made or created documents. Okay, where did this? Who made this? Where where was it made? So now we've got a field here that has artists, but it has a little ellipses after it. 
And what this is, when I click on this, this will bring up a list of all the people and entities that I've already got in my system here. So if this is created by somebody or an entity that's already exists in my system, I just have to start searching for them and I can find them. Unfortunately, I don't know who made this. These types of jars are, um, they're fairly common and I don't, and, 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 and who made them is really difficult to tell. It's probably been hand painted, in a, uh, but I do know a few things about it. I know that it was made about 1885. And I can use my little circle button here. Um, I can put it a date range if it was made up through some kind of a date range. I can assign a time period to it. Uh, and time periods are really, I think there's super handy way to, to sort of segregate and, and uh, uh, your collections there. So when I click on this, you can see we've got some examples in here, centuries, but I've also created a bunch of time periods just based on um, decades, essentially. So I've started to classify the collection by decade. Um, this jar I'm gonna put in here as the 1880s. Uh, if I knew the place that it was made, I could attach that as well. And you can see, this is kind of neat. When I click on place, you can see the places I've created. And places in catalog are entirely hierarchical. So you can see that I've got a, a place here that's called the Adams Home, that's in Oakland, in California, in the United States, in North America. And I can actually add into this uh, um, hierarchy at any level that I, that I want to. If I wanted to say that Oakland is in Alameda County, I could do that. Or if I could say that it's in you know central Oakland in within the city of Oakland within California, a particular neighborhood, I could do that. Uh, that could be really handy for um, again for searching. I could look at everything I've got that relates to Oakland or to California. Uh, for museums, it's particularly useful, especially for historical museums that have uh, you know specific areas within their uh, their geography that are really particularly important. But I don't know where this jar exactly was made either. I've got more research to do there. Uh, so I'm going to scroll down here, and again, these fields, I think, as you get into them, are going to be really uh, 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 intuitive. Another one I want to point out is location. So location is really where does this thing live within, within your house or within your, your, within your collections. And locations, just like those places on the surface of the earth, they're also really hi completely hierarchical. And that's really important for reporting purposes, particularly. So if you, you, know, if you need to, for, to create an insurance report, maybe something you had a, a water leak that damaged part of your house, and you can quickly look at, you, at what parts of your, your collections might have been within that area that was damaged. So when I click on it again, here's all the locations I've created, and you can see that they live hierarchically just like those uh, places on the earth. So there's a location called a bookcase that's in the living room on the first floor within that open hall. So I'm gonna click that. Actually, that's where this jar is currently. I could assign a category to it if I wanted to, if it's on exhibit or if it's in storage or anything like that, I won't. Um, it's gonna assign the date <clears throat> because locations change over time and uh, uh, you can actually keep track of all the locations that things have been at. I could add a new location now uh, and it'll keep track of the fact that it had once been at this bookcase, uh, but it's gonna, it's gonna all sort to the most recent date at the top. Uh, so, and then again, I could, uh, uh, attach it or document where I per where this came from, uh, what its value is, if it's got some kind of insurance, uh, if it's part of an insurance policy or a rider, I wanna attach it, I can do that there, document that there. Uh, relationships is one I really wanna point out here though. So this jar, this is again a, an example of, of something that has um, intrinsic value. So that jar itself is not a super valuable thing. I mean, at the, at the antique store, it'd probably be $25 or something like that, but it has a lot of uh, a personal connection to me. That jar was given to my grandmother by my great-grandmother. So I'm first gonna attach, say that it's related to my great-grandmother. So I start to type in her name, Margarita Roth Trimberger. And here I put the note here that, that this was probably a wedding gift to her when she was married in 1887. Um, but I've got other people. She actually gave it to my grandmother. So she gave it to Duluda. I'm gonna attach it to Duluda still. And then I write notes that she gave this as a wedding present to, to Julia Estelle. Um, Julia gave it to my mother. So I've also attached my mother and then described that you know, this eventually passed on to my mother. Um, it was a, a wedding present. So I can, I've actually started to collect things that relate to my grandparents' wedding here. So I've actually got them in here. So uh, I'm gonna attach it to this wedding. So now this jar is connected to these people. It's connected to this wedding. It's connected to um, actually, for a related place, I know that it was in Sheboygan for most of its life, so I could connect it to Sheboygan, actually. I, if I start to type that in, I can see that I've created Sheboygan. So now we've related the jar to Sheboygan as well. So that's a, a great way to relate things. Uh, another thing I want to point out here is web links. So if I, if I do more research on this particular jar and I find maybe a, a website that deals with that particular type of of, uh, of glass, it was really popular around the turn of the last century, or I could paste in the, the link. And give it a label that makes it easily uh, referenceable within my records here. 
Um, so I, I also want to point out up here at the top, this is where your ID number would go if you're using some kind of a, a, an inventory number for your items. Uh, but underneath that are folders. So remember uh, that whole list of folders I have? When I click on this, they're all available to me here, and, and I can start attaching this to, to these particular folders. So for instance, this uh, jar, I've actually I created that folder called mom. I'm going to put this in my mom folder. Um, if I want to add it to any of these other folders, I could. I could just click that the box here and you can see that they appear up here and then all of a sudden it's going to be displayed along with that group of items there. So I'm done with that. And another thing I'm going to point out that can be super useful are tags. So tags, you can think of as being a post-it note you stick on your entry. And they can be really helpful for, for helping you maintain your collections uh, all different kinds of ways. When I click on this, you'll see the tags that I've created here. Needs dimensions, needs photos. Those are two that I use constantly. Um, having dimensions, I, I would really recommend, you know, when you're first cataloging your items and you're taking pictures, take some good pictures, take as many pictures as you as you can of that item, all different views, but also get its dimensions. And you're holding that thing at the time, take a, you know, put a ruler in your picture, measure them, uh, get those dimensions at that time. This jar, I actually could use a few more photos of, so I'm going to tag as needs photos. And that way I can come back and look at everything else I've got need, that needs photos. And if I've got my camera out sometime and maybe I've got my little photo booth set up and I'm taking some nice pictures, I could put the jar in there and take my additional photos and then just remove the tag. I'm going to click save there. And now we will see what the entry looks like. So it's populated it here into my, into my all entries. So let's go ahead and click on it. Um, now we're viewing that entry. You can see the relationships that, that you know, with just a few moments here, we've actually created all these things. It's, fully hierarchical locations here. It's related to these other people. It's related to Sheboygan. Uh, it's related to this wedding. So already, even without me having typed anything in the, in the record, just by selecting things, I've actually documented this to a fair extent here, just by a few clicks. So I've begun to document this now. It's, it's on its way to being, uh, to being well documented. Uh, to edit, I just click my little edit pencil here. And it opens up the whole thing for all kinds of, of editing. I can edit my image here if I needed to. If I have multiple images, I can rearrange them. This, this little bar here would expand and show, you know, you can move it up or down one. Um, I can click and add more images. I can take more images. I can attach files to my record here, but I can also add as much other information as I've got. So I'm not editing my mouse. I'm just going to cancel out of it there. So once you've documented your things, um, things like for me, this family, the, the family things are particularly important to, to me. And I love the idea of being able to share them. So with any catalog and subscription, you have the ability to publish to what we call the catalog hub. It's a, 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 an easy way to share your collections out with the world. So I'm going to leave my catalog account here. So this is where I have to be a logged in user to, to the account to be accessing this. I'm going to turn on my lights here. So it's down from me, the sun in my eyes to, <laughs> to the dark here. Um, so again, this is my logged in collection, but I'm going to hop out of this into another tab. This is the catalog hub. And so this is a pub, the public website. This is where the world can go and, and explore, you know, either my collections or anybody else's collections that's being published. We, we have probably something like, I don't know, four or 500,000 items right now being shared on the catalog hub from various uh, museums and other collections and collectors. So this is my own personal hub page here. I call it the DPR collections. Um, you'll create it by adding a little uh, uh, image to be your logo image and a background image, and you can have a full description here for your location and a link to your website if you've got a website. I don't have a website myself, so. But here's the things I'm sharing. So these again are those folders. Uh, here's that dolls folder we were just looking at. Uh, I can go back and I can search across any particular folder. I can search across all my stuff to the extent of the text that I've shared. So this is you can imagine here. I can you know send a link to my cousins. Let me go down here to my postcards. This link right here is a stable link up here. I could send this link to my cousin, say, go to this link and just search for uh, grandma's last, uh, grandpa's last name. And they'll get all my postcards that have some kind of connection to my grandpa. They can, you know, click on, for instance, that one we were just looking at. Here's what that looks like on the, on the hub. They can read the details of the postcard and the full transcription that I have here. So I can, you know, this kind of delicate old postcards can be shared with my cousins that are all over the place. Uh, a neat and easy way to share your collections. And publishing is really easy as well. You can see these various folders I've got here published. Let me go back here to my main page. Let's go back and publish a new folder. So I'm going to go back to my all entries here. Uh, search, click on my main menu. And let's see, I've got, um, gosh, here's a furniture folder that's not being published. I've just added a few items into there. So just started to document a few things here. But I'm going to click on my three dots here. My actions menu, the things I can do with this group of items. And one of the things I can do is publish the folder. So I click that, and now if you notice here, there's a check mark there. It's published. 
I'll go to the catalog GitHub and I'll just refresh the web page here. And within just a couple of seconds, I published the furniture folder along with all these. Uh, you know, in this case, I'm publishing you know a fair amount of data about these items, but literally within a couple of seconds, I published these uh, these six items. So quick and easy to do. So uh, and and easy to share with the world here. So. There's a couple of other ways you can do that. So once again, the catalog at Hub is included with anybody's subscription. Um, you can see that our friends here. This is at the New Muse. This is at the New Muse website, <laughs> the New Museum's website. So this is on their exhibition and collections page. So if you scroll down here, you can get to this particular page. It's our permanent collection, and so uh, they've got a nice description here about the permanent collection. But lo and behold, here's Explore the Collection. And when I click on this link on their website, it takes me right directly to their Hub page where. Alexandra's got 11, uh, 1100 items shared out there right now. She's sharing a couple of neat folders, uh, subdividing the collection in various ways here. So you know, we can click on this again and see the, the items that the Museum of Los Gatos is sharing right now, all kinds of uh, really fascinating stuff. It's really fun. So again, it's included with the, with the catalog and subscription. Uh, but some of our users want to go beyond this and actually publish directly to their own websites, and we provide some uh, easy ways to do that as well. So that actually requires an additional subscription to use our API. Um, but there's a, a couple of great ways to do that. So I've got some examples here to show you here. This is um, this is actually this is the Royal Montreal Regiment Museum up in uh, in Montreal, Canada. And so this is on their own live website, but they're using our an iframe integration, which is essentially projecting their hub page, but onto their own website. So this is a case where they're not. Uh, they're not having to direct people over to their to their hub page, but they've got their hub page essentially presented directly on their site. And you can see, uh, for instance, you know, it's uh, quick and easy and very uh, responsive. But you can see the, what they're sharing out to the world uh, on their website. So this again, this is using an iframe integration. Um, we also have a great WordPress plugin if you built your site with WordPress. Uh, here's an example of that. This is the American Bookbinders Museum. Maybe Daniel will be interested being at the library. Um, this is uh, up in San Francisco. It's a really neat little museum. If you haven't been there, it's actually really, really interesting. But this is on their website. They've used their, our WordPress plugin to create this directory here. So they've got uh, an exhibit, for instance, Bound for Beauty. You can look at their exhibit hall and see, um, click down there. You can see all this neat equipment that deals with, uh, with uh, the, really the art and the science of book binding. Uh, entry here, let's take a quick look. Yeah, so there's a book press that's in their gallery right now. Uh, but then this is live on their website. Um, the plugin allows for a lot of really neat um, customization as well. So here's another kind of a neat example, I think. This is the uh, Chattanooga Historical Society, Chattanooga, Tennessee, of course. Uh, now these are these links below, these are their folders that they're currently publishing. So they've gone and done a little bit more customization there. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of their folders and see what their entries look like. So again, the plugin, the WordPress plugin allows for uh, much more customization. So it starts to look you know, much more customized here. Let's take a look at one of their folders here, or one of their entries. The old citizen of, Ch of Chattanooga. It's just great. And here's the details, that the data that they've allowed to be published. Um, now, once again, you're publishing uh, folders at a time. So you control what's in that folder. You also have complete control over the data that you're sharing if you want to publish. So you don't, you know, in my mind, I don't publish the values of things. I don't, uh, uh, I don't publish their condition, for instance, those are things that sort of the museums don't publish either. So you have control over what data gets shared out with the world. Now, one other one I want to point out is using the API and building a completely custom display. This is another, just a beautiful website. This is at the uh, Vermont Historical Society. Uh, they're using our, our API and they've built a, just an entirely customized display with it. So you can uh, explore, for instance, Innovation in Vermont. I click on this, this is their folder. Uh, it's being fed live from catalog it. So here's the uh, the entries that they published in this folder. We can look, for instance, at this butter churn uh, and the data that they're sharing. Um, if they edit any of this data, it's immediately available on the web. They don't have to do anything special to republish it. It's automatically, it's a live connection between their account and what they're publishing out to the web. So that, in a sort of a quick nutshell, is catalog and how you can actually document your things, I think, hopefully easily and get them shared out with, um, with the people you want to share to the extent you want to share. You don't have to share it all. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm happy to answer any kind of questions at all that might be out there um, and uh, to talk more about, about catalog and, 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 uh, and how it works and how you might use it. So any questions at all?
Alex, do we, Alexander, do we have any questions? Does anybody? Uh, there was just one question about um, if items could be in multiple folders at once, but that was answered in the chat. Sure. <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> how that works. So if I click, for instance, on this um, this little OIA here, for instance, you can see that it's in my ceramics folder and in my Southwest pottery folder. So it's in it's it's being displayed in all, always in all entries, but also in these two other folders here. So yeah, I've started to document some of these pieces together. Absolutely. It looks like Allison has a question. Sure. Yeah, I uh, think. Go ahead. You can uh, ask it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think we're going to go ahead and save all the questions until the end. Um, so, but if you have them, uh, keep them coming, keep putting them in the chat. And I think uh, if Dan is done, we will uh, switch over to Daniel from the Los Gatos Library. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, that's great, Dan. It's cool to see how versatile your program is. That's really awesome um, and super powerful for museums and for personal collectors. Um, again, I'm Daniel Keo. I'm a librarian at the Los Gatos Library. Um, maybe you've seen me around, maybe you haven't. Um, but I collect in the nonfiction, I coordinate adult programs, but I also manage the local history room. So um, anytime you're asking history questions at the library, I am likely the person that you're going to be talking to. So I just wanted to quickly touch on some of the free resources that we've got at the library that you could use if you're jumping into cataloging your own collection. Um, honestly, the most important part to start is just getting your library card. Um, if you don't have a library card already, it's very easy. All we need to see is an ID and some anywhere from anywhere in California and something that proves your address. And from there, you have free access to everything that we provide. Um, we have obviously books, movies, we have take home kits, um, but we also have a lot of free electronic resources. And so um, those resources can help you do your own research and be able to provide some context to the items that you might have in your personal collection. Um, some of those resources, I just wanted to highlight a couple, were um, that you can use Ancestry through the library. So you do have to be on the library's Wi-Fi. However, anytime that you're at the library, you can go into Ancestry and do some research. So if there are people in your family or people mentioned in your collections, um, whether like postcards, um, if they're written to different people, you could do some research on those people. Um, you can find out more you can, about like immigration papers. Um, Ancestry is really good with death and birth notices and really connecting you to those family histories that also give you a little more context on the place um, that these people have lived. I'd also like to direct people to History Los Gatos. That's a shared resource um, with NUMU through the Los Gatos History Project. You can access that database at any time from home. Um, and that's where we have uh, the majority of our digitized items. So you can see photographs, old maps, documents, really all the things that we either have here in the local history room um, or also at the Newman's archives. Um, so I would say go to historyloscatos.org and browse around. And especially if, you're, if your collection is hyper-local to Los Gatos or the Santa Clara Valley, um, it can be really helpful to kind of get an idea of what else was happening at that time or find photos of people mentioned in your own documents or even your own family history. And finally, we have that San Jose Mercury News Archive. Um, they have their public domain papers available through NewsBank and you can just click the link on our website and go right to those, to those archive newspapers. And then they also have um, text versions of all of the articles since 1985. Um, so those, those e-resources are really helpful. And one resource that we offer at the library is RetroTech. Um, RetroTech is a program that uh, basically a few years ago, the state library funded our ability to purchase a bunch of equipment to help digitize old materials, whether those are tapes like cassettes, VHS tapes, photographs, uh, reels, Super 8 film, really anything that you can think of that you that is not born digital. So we can really help you digitize those things. The process is pretty, pretty simple. Um, you identify the things that you need digitized. Maybe you have a bunch of old papers, you have uh, old photographs, 
maybe you have like precious materials like that um, that are at risk of falling apart and you wanna make sure that you're able to digitize them before they disappear. So you would identify the things that you wanna digitize. You go to that form website on our, on, through our website and fill out the nomination form. We just ask for your name and email address and then a short description of what it is that you wanna digitize. And then our librarians will reach out to you when we get that form and figure out an appointment. So you can either make an appointment to use the equipment yourself, or you can drop off your things and we can help digitize them for you. Then you'll organize, sort, and clean your materials just so there's nothing hazardous in there. It always helps to make sure that all the photographs that you have are the same size, um, like all your postcards together, all your small photographs, all of your large form photographs and all the other paper documents that are about the same size, just because it makes it way easier to do quickly, um, just so you can get your project done more quickly. And then when you have an appointment date, you'll just bring your materials and your flash drive to the library, and we can help you do the rest. Um, so again, just a, a quick recap, come get a library card, come visit us at the library. We're here 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day of the week. Um, you know, if you don't have a card yet, there's no shame. You just come over with your photo ID and something that proves your address, and you'll be set within a couple of minutes. You can check out the e-resources page um, and just see what might be helpful for your research. And obviously, reach out to us, call us, and figure out what maybe maybe a resource you can't find, but that we know we have to help you with your your own research. And then sign up for RetroTech. If you've got things that you know you want digitized, really precious memories that you want saved, um, we can help you make that happen. And that's all. If you have any questions, you can email the library. If you think of something later, um, that's library at loscatosca.gov. Or if you have history research questions and want to chat with me, you can email us directly at history at loscatosca.gov. Okay, great. Thank you, Daniel. That was a lot of great resources uh, for everyone here to hear about. Um, we do have some questions. Um, the first question is, um, is it possible to hide information for security purposes, like the location, if you have something of value, which I believe you might have touched on, Dan, but if you want to I mean, mentioned that again. Yeah, absolutely. You control what fields you're publishing out to the world. So you, I mean, you don't have to, you know, I don't publish the values of things out to the world. I mean, I, I've got that all tracked, but I don't publish the values of things. Uh, and, you know, museums typically don't publish values. They don't publish, um, you know, the exact location often in the museum is something that's sensitive. You don't want to necessarily publish that condition reports or things you don't typically publish. Um, yeah, so you, you have control exactly over what fields are published. So you, there's as part of setting up for web publishing, you actually get a list of all the possible fields and you just select the specific ones you want to share. So you have control over that. Great. Good to know. Um, our next question is, at the beginning, you did a search for babies. Was that an image search or a data search through the descriptions? It's not just through the descriptions, it's through every piece of text that's in there. So, so long as the text someplace is something in that record mentions the word baby or babies, because it's going to also look for a plural, it'll find that entry. So it's really, it's actually a really easy kind of powerful. I didn't really mention, it's it's also sort of like a Boolean. You can also do Boolean type searches in that search bar. So a, a string of words and put it in quotes, it'll find that. You can use a plus symbol between words and it'll find entries that include all those words, but not necessarily together. Uh, if you just type in two words, it's going to find anything that includes either of those words. So it, it, it can be very useful. Great. Um, for institutions seeking to boost visibility, is there a social media integration option? Or what about entries coming up in a Google search? Sure. Well, Google, I mean, a Google search is, you know, you're, you're competing with the world, but the, the more you, you, when you put things out on the internet, they're, they're, they start to get searchable. The more they get indexed, the more they get looked at, the more they'll, they'll come up in Google searches. So think the things you, you're publishing can be found. I mean, they're going to be found, the, the, they'll be more likely found the more that they're, the more that they're linked and the more that they're looked at. That's just, the, unfortunately, the way that Google search works, but they certainly can be found. Um, if you're using our plugin right now, the plugin is, is, is great. I mean, you can publish directly to, um, to Facebook and things like that really quite easily. And we'll be uh, enabling the hub to do that uh, shortly, but you can certainly link to it. You can link to those entries uh, to your social media, absolutely. Awesome. 
And then the only other question that I see that I think might be on everyone's mind is, uh, what is the cost? <laughs> Yeah, and we're we're completely open about about our pricing. We have our entire pricing is published on our website. There's no secrets at all. So for a private collection, it starts at $149.99, so $150 a year essentially, and that enables you to to document up to 2,500 items, so 2,500 separate entries. So each one of those little squares in my in my grid is an entry, and that entry can have you know as many images as you want. There's no limit to the number of images attached to that one entry. And it's connected to all those other records, but it's still just one entry. So uh, that your subscription would include 2,500 entries. It includes up to three users. And I didn't, that's another thing I should have touched on, but having at least somebody else have access to your account is really, it's just super important. You know, if something happens to you, for instance, in my account, my, my, my brother actually has access to my account. That if something happens to me, all this information isn't lost, you know, <laughs> the details behind all these, you know, baskets or, you know, whatever they might be, all those details are there. So three users uh, and publishing to the catalog at Hub. So again, um, 2,500 entries, three users publishing to the Hub, uh, and also 100, uh, excuse me, 50 gigs of storage. So those, and that's gigs of storage just for your uploaded images. Uh, everything else you're putting in there, we don't charge against your, uh, your storage. So uh, a fair amount. And for an institution, uh, a, sm a small museum or a small organization plan uh, starts at 449.99, so essentially $450 a year. That includes up to 25,000 entries. Uh, it includes eight users, uh, 100 gigs of storage and publishing to the web via the hub. And if you wanna add on publishing into your own website, like some of those examples I've shown, uh, so for either a personal account or for uh, uh, any kind of business account, uh, that's just an additional $240 a year. So that's all our costs. And if you wanna see them all, go to uh, catalogit.app. Um, you'll see there's a pricing table and you can see all our pricing all, all right there. Great. Um, we did have another question come in, but you answered it in your last answer. Um, does the subscription service let more than one person log in? And the answer was yes. You can have up to three people on a personal uh, subscription and eight on an institutional subscription. And you can add more for this. Just you just pay for additional users if you want to. And I should also point out that you know that's a user is an email address that has access. So you know, Alexandra, I hope you're using it not only on your desktop, but on your laptop and on your phone and on your tablet because using them all in conjunction is just is super useful. So, I mean, the way I use it is I take a picture of my phone, I'm logged in, you know, you can see I'm logged into the same account right now on my phone, I don't know if that shows in there, but I can take a picture of the item and start documenting, save that, save the entry on my phone, but it, then it's immediately available on my computer and I can continue doing all my real typing. I'm a terrible phone typist, so yeah. Or to have it open on your tablet, you know, being able to look at an image that you've got on your tablet and pinch and zoom way in to look at the details, look at the signature, look at that little maker's mark that you can't read with your own naked eye, but you can zoom way in and read it and type in the, the details on the, on your um, on your laptop or your computer. So use them all. Yeah. Okay. Well, this next question is for me. Um, how did I break down the folders in New Muse catalog? Yes. Um, and as I answer that, I'm going to go ahead and drop the direct link to our hub website in the chat for everyone to reference. Um, so our catalog is broadly divided into three categories right now, um, our history collection, our art collection, and our archives. Um, and so our history collection refers to pretty much all of our 3D objects that we have, anything from, you know, I think from chairs to taxidermy to clothing. And then our art collection refers to more traditional fine art objects. So paintings, drawings, sculptures, everything like that. And then our archives is all of our paper documents and ephemera. So photographs, newspapers, newspaper clippings, all of that. So you'll see we have <laughs> much less uh, categories on our hub than Dan did on his, um, but they're just broadly in those three categories. I should, I should point out, if you, if you went to just uh, hub, so she's if you, on, on her link, you can see the full link along with that account number at the end. If you remove that account number, you'll just go to the main page of the hub. And there's a few sort of, we periodically have some uh, highlighted accounts there. But if you click on collections there, you can actually see all the other entities and people that are using the hub. And, you know, some of them are all set up and some of them are getting themselves set up. But it's really kind of fun. You can also search from the main page across about a half a million entries that are posted by institutions all over the world. I mean, we have a, a museum in Laos is publishing now their collections out to the, to the hub. So it's, uh, it's really kind of neat. 
But then you can also see that people have their their folders organized by all kinds of things. Any kind of a theme that you want to publish as a group, you create a folder, and, and there you go. Actually, and look, thinking about Daniel's, um, you know, that RetroTech is really, really cool. I, I mean, that is just a great service. That, you know, if you're to go in and have a bunch of your old, you know, his valuable, personally valuable things digitized like that, then being able to come back and put them into a system like Catalog it where you can actually start to add more documentation and share them and, and, and you know, make more use of them uh, and, and save you from having to worry about what happens to that thumb drive after you've got all that, all that great document, all that great digitization on there. So really, really cool. Yeah. Um, we have another great question. Can information be imported into the app from another database or possibly also like from an Excel spreadsheet? Sure. Yeah, you can. There, if you um, when you create a folder, one of the things you go up to those three dots on the corner, you click on that. One of the things you'll see there is import. And if you click on that, it'll actually bring it. You can actually go from a link there to, that opens up our import guide that'll kind of walk you through the process of importing from a spreadsheet. Um, we import uh, museum accounts all the time out of you know complicated museum software. So if you've got a relatively simple spreadsheet, it's actually easy to, to create entries directly from that from that spreadsheet. Great. CSV or Excel format you can import directly. Great. Um, I think this question might be more for Daniel, um, but if someone were to use the RetroTech service at the library, would they have to download the images to their computer prior to updating catalog it? And I say more to Daniel because I'm not sure what form they get the digitized items back from RetroTech. Yeah, it'll be it'll be pretty standard. So we'll, I mean, we can we can work with you to figure out exactly what you need. But usually we we would um, if we're digitizing like photos, for instance, we're gonna do it either as like a PNG or a TIFF, TIF, um, TIFF, just like something more high resolution. Um, and I would be willing to bet Dan would be a better answer. I'd be willing to bet you could plug the USB into any computer and then just drag your files in without actually loading loading them onto your computer. I imagine. Exactly right. Exactly right. You can click once you open up that thumb drive on your computer, you can click those and drag them into the entries as you create them. It would be really simple. That's a just such a neat, uh, a neat solution. Yeah, we could even probably help you do that uh, at the library if that's the if that's the route you went. We could once it's all finished, you could come bring your laptop or whatever, plug your USB in, and just drag them into your collection right there, probably. Or actually, if you have computers at the library, somebody can log into their catalog account on that computer. So long as they logged out when they left, that's it. <laughs> so make sure you have logged out when you left. Yeah. Uh, uh, Michelle has a question. Uh, what are some of the items that the library is actively cataloging or has on site? Very funny you say that because I'm surrounded uh, by the things that um, the state library just awarded us a grant for digitized through California Reveal. So I'm gonna have some of our uh, old funeral home records digitized. So we've had an index of what, I can just show you a pile of them right here. And um, all of these old books uh, have funeral records from the early 1900s. And so the funeral home directors here, um, whenever someone passed away, they noted birth date and place, death date and place, any information they had on the person, including, um, cause of death. And then they would also usually paste in a newspaper article um, from their obituary. And so those are super valuable and those will actually be um, hosted by, by it through California Revealed. But that's one thing that we're working on that I get to kind of actually ship out. Um, otherwise, we, uh, we've had a few donations of photographs from residents, just historic photographs that we're gonna start working through and scanning and having digitized. Um, yeah. Lots, lots of stuff. <laughs> We've got lots of Los Gatos history here waiting to be digitized. Great. And that takes us almost right up to time. Um, I don't think I've seen any more questions in the chat, um, but I want to thank you all for being here tonight and learning more about how New Mew is using Catalog It to help preserve Los Gatos history and how you can use Catalog It to help preserve your history. Um, so thank you, Dan and Daniel, both for coming and participating. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. And uh, if you have any more questions, um, I'm sure Dan and Daniel would be happy <laughs> to answer them. Um, I don't know if you guys want to drop your emails in the chat, um, if people want to contact you. I think Daniel already put his on his slides, but yeah.
Thank you so much, everyone.